Thank you for joining us today our web, for our webinar on cap tables and exit scenarios. This is the fifth webinar in our funding and equity webinar series. My name is Kirsten Loita. I'm a partner at Osage University Partners, leading our university relations efforts. We have two of my fellow OU peers joining us today. We'll go to the next slide and I'll have them introduce themselves. Uh, let's start off with Anurag. Hi, everyone. Anurag Agarwal. I'm a partner uh, in the life science investment team. My background is PhD in cell biology and a few years in strategy consulting before joining OUP around six years back. Thanks, Anurag. Manny. Yep, and I'm Manny Stockman. Thanks for setting this up, Kirsten. And thanks, for everyone, for joining. So I'm a, a partner at OUP as well. I've been here for, I think, eight years is what LinkedIn told me a couple of days ago. Uh, and it's... Um, you know, been awesome to be a part of the team and work with so many of the universities. My background is applied physics and aerospace engineering, and I tend to focus on our tech side of the fund. Well, congratulations on your anniversary there, Manny. That's terrific. Uh, before we get started, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we'll um, get uh, answer a few questions that we always get asked on these particular webinars. There, the slides and a recording um, of this particular webinar will go out to all of our registrants, so that will be sent out to you afterwards. It will all they will also be available on our partner portal, which is something that our partner universities have access to. Um, the, and there are instructions on here about how you'll be able to find those. We also will have a recording of this on our YouTube channel as well. We do encourage questions throughout the webinar. Please use the Q&A tool uh, in Zoom to submit your questions. Please don't use the chat function. That's harder for us to track the questions and respond to them. Uh, I will review those questions as they come in um, and ask them appropriately to our um, panelists as I'm able to. We did receive a number of questions beforehand, many of which will be answered during the slides of this webinar, and I'll ask some others along the way. Some of the um, questions that were asked actually are, are more appropriate for some of the other webinars we have. We'll follow up with you afterwards uh, regarding that information. I do want to mention um, that we have some other webinars coming up. We're going to be taking a break in July from our webinars. We've been doing a lot of them lately, but we will restart in August uh, with more webinars. We'll have the um, final webinar in our um, in this funding and equity um, uh, webinar series. That's going to be on board and board seats. That'll be happening, I believe. Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but it is in August. And then we also have another webinar um, uh, on our patient data licensing uh, series. And that's going to be a case studies webinar that will also be happening in August. We'll follow up with everyone just to let them know uh, the registration information for those particular webinars uh, after the webinars, this today's webinar as well. And we'll move on to the next slide. We do just want to mention um, the Equalize program is coming up. Uh, the Equalize program, this is a program that we're, we're, we're focusing on uh, women academic uh, entrepreneurs and uh, having them go through a six month mentorship um, uh, for the, and that's been happening for the last six months now. And our culmination event is happening this Thursday, so two days from now. We are inviting uh, people to join us for that, see these uh, terrific pitchers uh, pitch uh, for their um, their final time through this program. We will also be having a uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Bhatia from MIT, and a terrific uh, panel presentation as well about the uh, getting funding in a challenging economic environment. So registration information is noted here, and I think uh, Katie also just put that in the chat as well. So please feel free to join us uh, for the Equalize program uh, this coming Thursday. We'll move on to the next slide. Uh, just want to give you a short intro to OUP for those of you who do not know us. We're a venture fund that partners with academic institutions to invest in their startups, typically by exercising participation rights available through their licenses. As part of this relationship, uh, the institutions share in our profits and receive programmatic support on tech transfer and academic startups, such as this webinar today. We're now on our fourth fund and have made investments in over 130 different companies in all areas of deep science. And many of those companies have had successful exits either through IPOs or, uh, or merger and acquisition. And the next slide shows some of our portfolio companies and the breadth of areas that we invest in. If we can go to the next slide. We're always happy to talk with, talk with anyone about our model. To, um, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions about that. And then I'm going to pass it over to Manny. He's going to go over the um, agenda for today, where we're talking again about um, cap tables and exit scenarios for startup companies. So Manny, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, thanks, Kirsten. Um, so I don't know if Anurag knows this, but we have big shoes to fill with this presentation because I think our highest viewed YouTube video is Bill Harrington's um, 
version of this presentation. So we've updated it. It's a it's a new modern cap table discussion. I just want everyone to know. Um, but really, we wanted to put it in a webinar uh, so that it maybe has a, a better take home value for you all. And hopefully, we can eclipse Bill's um, view count. But um, you know, really, what we're going to go through today is you know what matters for investors and founders and anyone who owns equity in a startup. It's it's how much do you own in various exit scenarios, and also how much have you invested. And so we're going to run you through some of the um, views of cap tables and investing in companies and how equity gets diluted over time um, towards an exit. And so we're going to uh, create a fictitious uh, company called Biostar Therapeutics and run through a few fundraising scenarios um, and also look at a few outcomes of uh, exits, you know, good and bad, and then run you through some of the quick math on uh, what that means in terms of returns, both for investors and but also the founders and the universities. Um, and then we'll just kind of wrap up with a few takeaways. So uh, just to kind of give you the intro, Biostar Therapeutics is a fast moving you know, university spin out. Um, this is a hypothetical company that uh, I do not need to have very deep scientific background to do this webinar on today, but Anurag will fill in the gaps. But they are um, working towards a new therapeutic uh, in the RAS, for the, with the RAS pathway. They've brought a, they've licensed in a new target from a university. And um, in that license, uh, in this fictitious company, the university has been given a 5% equity uh, upfront in the startup alongside the founders before any capital has gone in. And in the license, there also, surprise, surprise, happens to be a 10% participation right uh, for the university's um, uh, uh, partner, Osage University Partners. And so this is the kind of general um, story we're going to work through through multiple fundraising rounds in this discussion. And what you will see in some of these slides is a very you know PowerPoint friendly form of a cap table. And uh, what you all should be thinking about as a cap table is really just a ledger of ownership uh, of how many shares you own in a company and how many share uh, someone owns in a company, and then how many shares are outstanding in that company. Uh, how many shares exist so that you can identify what percent of the startup is owned by the uh, entity on the ledger. And there's various stages of investment, various um, units of shares, and various types of shares. There's preferred shares and common shares. There's also warrants and options. We're not going to go through all of these things um, in this discussion, but really just to orient everyone, this cap table that you see here is something you'll see through the presentation. And what we're calling out are founder shares. These are the, the researchers or entrepreneurs that are starting the company. The university's shares, which in Biostar and this company um, is, as I mentioned, a 5% ownership for the university. So the university starts with 50,000 shares and the founders have 950,000 shares. And then at some point in one of our rounds, we're also gonna create an option pool. And as a reminder, option pools are what a startup uses to uh, uh, give equity options to potential employees or future employees um, and executive hires. And then as you move towards investment rounds, uh, new entities come on the cap table. Uh, the Series A investors, the Series B investors, and OUP is what we'll model out. Um, there's also occasionally in a uh, uh, company's fundraising trajectory, convertible notes that they raise. And we'll go through an example of that as well. And so generally think of this cap table as the record of how much you've purchased of a company and how many shares you own over time. Just going on the next slide, this is to orient to you as to what we're gonna go through. There's millions of permutations of investment trajectories for startups, but this is the trajectory of the, the uh, company that we're gonna work through today, uh, where they raise a seed round and a convertible note and then from there on, there's uh, three scenarios we're going to create. There's a Series A, uh, which is going to be an up round. That's uh, they're really their first round because it's the uh, previous one was a convertible note. A Series B, which is another up round, and an up round in your mind you should be thinking of a valuation for the company that is higher than their previous rounds post money valuation. Generally, like when things are going well, everything's on this upward trajectory. And then the ultimate upward trajectory um, culmination is a good exit. So that's scenario one. Um, scenario two 
is the situation where the company is on this high flying trajectory, but they have a weak exit. And so that weak exit um, is something that might can be defined in many different ways. But generally, this is an exit where the founders and even the investors are not happy with the outcome. Um, the third scenario is one where the company raises that seed round convertible note. They raise a series A round. But you know, let's say it was 2021 and everything was on the up and up and valuations were through the roof. And now we're in the world we're in today, 2023, when fundraising is a bit harder and the company takes a down round. A down round is when the pre-money valuation of this series B round in this case is lower than the post-money valuation of the series A round. Um, really it's about share price, but this is a simple way to think of it as pre-money and post-money. Um, but despite that down round, the company actually still has a great exit. And so we're gonna look at the, the difference in returns in those three scenarios and, and walk, I'll walk you through those today. So um, I'll pause there. Kirsten, are there any questions that have popped up that we should try and answer right now? Not yet. All right. Well, from here, I will pass the control to Anurag, who will walk you through some of the fundraisings that we're going to simulate. Thanks, Manny. Um, and, and as Manny laid out, we will uh, we will show you how this cap table or the Excel ledger of share count changes with each financing, and then in the end, Manny will take take us through the calculations of how, based on that ledger when you exit, how does that money gets distributed to different owners of those shares? So I'll, I'll just walk you through how your cap table, cap table will look like and evolve as, you, as the company raises different rounds of financing. So hopefully everybody can see the slides change. And so as uh, you know, Manny had initially highlighted, the company and most of the let's say therapeutics companies are raising a seed round first now you will see these are just fictitious examples and different companies will go through different rounds of financing with different sets of numbers this is just one let's say a, a line in the sand to show how the math works and not be anchored to any of the numbers that are presented here as being the rule of thumb for a normal financing so um, for the seed round, as you know, usually happens when a new technology is being licensed from an institution, a small round has been, you know, proposed by the investors. And the goal of that round is to replicate the academic data, to be able to repeat what the what we had seen in academic setting to make sure that, you know, it can be replicated outside um, and it could be done at different places to ensure the robustness to do that angel investors these are usually individual investors who are investing their own money um, and and these will be different than venture investors which we'll talk about later and these are generally investors who invest quite early and they have proposed a three million dollar now round at a convertible note and so what what a convertible note is is a vehicle and a way of investment where the investor doesn't have to put a value on the company, but the value of the company will be decided by a later round. And this, you know, when you're very early stage, you don't know the potential of the asset as much, and you're putting a small amount of money, this seems to be a preferred way. And again, these definitions and the reasons to use this can be covered in a different webinar. Um, but usually the key term in a convertible note have is, is what does it convert to? And we'll go, and I'll talk more about this in the Excel, but the key, and the most common term that is used with convertible note is a discount price. So that here, the discount is 20%. And then we'll go through the math and what this discount means later. And what will, uh, you know, what will this convertible note convert to? It will convert to common shares eventually as you know, as it converts for every uh, other investors. But in the interim, as you're raising financing, it, will convert, it can convert to a different uh, you know, preferred stack as well, which we'll talk. And since the 10% participation right that was there in the license, the OUP or university by that right will have a legal right to invest 10% of the round. So that means $3 million, you, the, a 300K will be the 10%. And so 
university assigns that right to OUP. And given, you know, um, it's still very early and actually an angel investor round, OUP decides not to participate. So this is the framework of how, you know, this round has come together. A $3 million round of convertible note where OUP has decided not to exercise the participation right. So if you go to the next slide, now this will kind of outlay how your the ledger evolves. And so if you see in the in the yellow, and hopefully people can see my arrow, this is the pre-funding round that Manny walked us through. The university has some share, the founders have some share, and the university has some share, totaling to a million shares in the company. Now that you add convertible note, you see the last the last uh, row in this in this ledger is three million dollars invested, which are dollars. However, how many shares this investor should get is still TBD. As I said, this is an early round. The investor hasn't put a value on the company, and without that value, you don't know how much money you should own. Uh, sorry. Um, it feels like the slides are moving. All right, thank you. Uh, and so right now, this will be TBD. So what, as we do the next round of financing, we will assign a value uh, on how much share this angel investors should get. So on the next slide, now let's say these $3 million round has been, uh, uh, you know, came together, the, you know, the academic data was replicated and was quite exciting that the company is able to raise the next round. And this is a standard series A venture funding round. And the goal of the round is now to expand on that initial observation, show that it, this drug works in animals and be able to select the drug that we can take to the clinic called the DC nomination, which is generally a great inflection point for small molecules. Now, this for to get there, we need $25 million round and the venture investors have provided a term sheet which says that they will invest $25 million round at a 50 million post money valuation. Now this, what does a post money valuation means? Post money valuation of a company is, it's a simple math of what the pre-money valuation is plus the total raise and that's the post money valuation. So here we are raising 25, at a pre-money valuation of 25, which gives us 50 as a post-money valuation. There are some additional term uh, along with the investment amount. One is that it includes option pool and in the pre-money. And what does, as Manny mentioned, option pool is this pool of common shares that can be given to executives in the company to incentivize them. Uh, and then also that investors have one X liquidation preference. And this term basically means is investors have the right to get their money out first before any other shareholders of the company get their money. Um, so the key, and then these are these are pretty standard terms that we see in term sheets. So uh, you know, fifteen percent option pool in the pre money, and one X liquidation preference. Now, with all of this metrics. You know, uh, one of the lawyers have put together their complicated Excel and have come up with a price per share. And this is going to become the true anchor point of deciding how much value of the company is and how do we distribute the share. So we should always anchor back to the share price. So this comes out to be 13.75 per share for the preferred stock. And because remember, we had convertible notes that were going to convert into this round at a 20% discount, they take a 20% discount to the current price, which is $13.75, that is around $11. And so the convertible note, people who took the earlier risk of replicating academic data, they are going to get a lower price because of that earlier risk. Uh, and so now, this is a round where OUP does exercise the 10% participation right. And that means 10% of the $25 million round, which is two and a half million and decides to invest two and a half million. So that, this is the overall, how the term sheet is, is shaped. I will show in the next slide how this impacts the share counts, the ledger and how it's recorded. Uh, but let me take a pause and, and see if there are any questions, Kirsten, that we should answer. Not yet. Okay, awesome. Um, we must be doing a great job explaining. 
All right. So uh, this is how, uh, you know, again, as you see, we are trying to build on what you had seen previously. But I'll walk through line by line and just make sure everything is clear here. So on the top, you see it's a round size. Round size is the total amount that you are raising. So 3 million was a convertible note. And now in the CD day round, you see 25 million. The pre-money valuation, this is what we talked about was in the term sheet is defined as 25 million because and adding these two round size plus pre-money gives us the next line item, which is the post money, 50 million. Now, and so, so given these terms, price per share that has been calculated is $13.75. And the other condition that we had talked about was option pools is 15% of the total company that is going to be included in the pre-money. And then we'll talk to that. So if you see the blue side of this Excel, how we have built. In the pre-funding, the shares were only provided to the first two lines, founders and the university. Now, as we are raising the Series A, we have this third line item, option pool A, which we're defining as number of shares added in the option pool for the Series A round, and which you see is 545,455 shares. This is equals to total 15% that was pre-specified. Now, if we go to the next bucket of items, which are preferred shares, and preferred shares are these unique class of shares that are given to investors. So founders, the executives in the company get common shares, while the investors in the company usually get preferred shares. And, and that preferred shares comes with that clause of 1x liquidation preference, which gives them the right to take that money out first when the company winds down, if they would like. So, the, and so now, given that we are raising a $25 million you know, Series A, investors are, get, are in this class of shares preferred. So OUP, as we mentioned, exercise 10% right. So it's a $2.5 million invested. Based on the share price of $13.75, OUP was awarded 181,818 shares. Similarly, the other Series A investors invested $22.5 million. And based on the same $13.75 uh, price per share, they had 1.6 million plus shares awarded to them. Now, as we talked about in the purple previously, Convertible note angel investors had invested 3 million, but they were not given any shares because we did not know what the price per share was. But now that we know it's $13.75, they get a discount of 20%, which is around $11 a share for them. And therefore, if you divide 3 million by $11, you get 272,000 plus shares that are now awarded to the convertible note holders as investors as well. So now, if we add all of these shares, if you look at FTS, which is fully diluted share count, this is all the shares that had outstanding in the company that have been awarded to different people or group of people. So we have 950,000 shares for the founders, 50,000 for universities, 545 for, you know, reserve for executives in the company that are hired today and will be hired in the future then in, uh, shares uh, to the Series A investors and the shares then to the angel investors who invested in the convertible note round. If you add all of these up, it makes it to be 3.6 million, north of 3.6 million shares. So what is a fully diluted ownership at this point? Founders, you take 950,000 shares divided by 3.6 million, which is the total number of shares that exist in the company. That gives you the you know, the ownership that you have in the company. And so the founders in the group own 26%, investors own 50%, and the angel investors own 10 or about 8% of the company. So this is how after the Series A round, you calculate what is, how is the equity of the company as a percentage divided by different group of people. So Anurag, we have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. there's, awesome. a lot of, there's a lot of confusion about this table, it seems like. Okay. So first thing, 
um, someone, and I'm going to go backwards in part because I think this will help explain things that people are trying to understand how you go from 3 million uh, which is what is um, invested in the seed round to the 25 million to the 50 million. So, and this is part of people understanding that 3 million is the amount that was invested in the seed round. Uh, but then the company had a new valuation when it came right. to the uh, series A round and that valuation was a certain amount. Um, so the, that was the pre, pre-money valuation of the series A round um, was 25 million. And then, then 25 million was invested in the round. So the post money valuation is 50 million, right? Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And so then people want to know, how did you get that price per share of 13.7? Yes. That was a question that a lot of people had. Yes. And that is the tough, the tough calculation that one of the lawyers in the company or one of the venture investors plugs a lot of numbers in the Excel and comes up with this. What does it include? So there are a few things to consider. What is, whenever we say pre-money valuation, pre-money valuation can be broken down into two things, is total number of shares that are not awarded to the investors, multiply it by share price. So that is the way to calculate this. We know the pre-money valuation is 25 million. Now, what are all the shares that are included in that pre-money valuation? So let's go through what are the shares that are included. So those are all the shares that have been awarded before this round happened, which is 950,000 shares to the founders, 50,000 shares to the university, and whatever this angel investor share that has not yet been calculated. So this is a little bit of trial and error method. And if somebody's building it in Excel, there is a great tool called Goal C, which we can go through in a separate webinar to figure out because you have to play with the price of a share and to say, what will it account? What does it mean for the pre-money valuation? So this includes, if you combine all of these shares, these are included in the pre-money. There is one more piece that is included in the pre-money that was defined in the term sheet. The term sheet said that there should be an option pool of 15% that is included in the pre-money. So if you look at the third row under the common shares, option pool A, 545,455 shares. These shares are also included in the pre-money. So now let's add all together what are the shares in the pre-money is. 950,000 founders, university 50,000, 545,000 plus shares in option pool, and 272,000 plus shares from the angel investors. This is the total number of shares that are included in the free money. When you multiply them by the share price, you get the pre money valuation, which has been defined as 25 million. So now you, you play with these numbers till you get that 25 million. And that's what share, that's the share price. Can I add one thing, Anurag? I think yes. um, this is like something that despite Anurag and I having always done cap tables now for several years, like you always uncover new things when you do this. But a key thing to think about is the way the venture investors wrote that term sheet. It was, we want to invest $25 million at a $50 million post, $25 million new dollars at a 50 million post. And after that money goes in, the post better be $50 million and there better be a 15% option pool. I don't care what happened before. I don't care about the 3 million convertible note. It's 25 new money with a $50 million convert, uh, post money. And that actually sets all everything that happens beforehand. It means you got to create whatever options need to exist such that it's 15%. In this case, it was 545,000. And then you need to convert the shares of the convertible note at whatever price such that it ends up being a, a $50 million post money. And so that, when you go through all that math, it's hard to explain over, um, over a presentation, but you just kind of have to force yourself into doing it in Excel and then it'll all play out from there. But the key thing is, whether things are in the pre-money or in the post-money. And in this scenario, both the convertible note and the options are what's called in the pre-money. It's called in the pre. 
And so that's just something that's like a nuance of, of yeah. the, the way we did it. And the other way to explain this further, I would say like the other way investors think about it is I will invest 25 million to own 50% of the company, right. right? So that means if you look at this preferred column and if you combine the OUP and other investors ownership, that is 45 plus five. And this is another way investors can think. They say, I will invest 25 million to own 50%. And this is what anchors everything else. You see that they own 50% and you have to put everything else that has the other 50% has to be divided between all the other shareholders that have existed or are being asked to exist like the option pool. So that's the, just the another way some of the investors may talk to you about. Jason. So um, one, one question some people have is, uh, is there a possibility of, um, and first of all, actually I have a question, is Manny controlling the slides right now or is Honorug? Both of us. Manny is. Okay, so some people are suggesting it would be really helpful if you can definitely keep using the cursor to, to circle you know, what you're talking about. Sure. Um, but uh, is, is there an Excel spreadsheet that you guys can share afterwards that kind of runs through exactly you know, what you guys have put together here so they can see how the numbers work? Um, we, we can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. The only thing that I would highlight again is because people are trying to figure out how do we get to a share price. And, and let me just give you a little bit of how we have done it. What we do is we start with the price of like $5. Randomly, we pick up in the air and said, you know, it's $5. And we run the entire map with it. And then we say, oh, no, that, that price is not right because the share count is calculated. It doesn't come to 25 million. Then we keep changing that price so that it converges to 25 million. You won't see that in Excel because there is an inbuilt function which helps you change one variable to achieve another variable of 25 million and a share price. So in the end, the Excel would just show $13.75 and the same math here. You won't see that iterative math that we had to do to converge those two numbers because Excel does it by itself. However, when we send, what you can do is, let's say the pre-money now is 30 million or 15 million, it will change the share price. And in the Excel we can share, you can change that number to get the new price. So the, just to kind of give like, they may not be able to see the back end working of figuring out the share price in the Excel that we have made because it is automatically done by Excel by using a function. All right, we have a lot of other questions. So let me, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I don't know if you can see the questions um, uh, yourselves right now. Uh, yeah, I'm scrolling I, through. What, now is, I can. Um, what if the founders want to participate in the Series A? Do they get additional shares? Um, the answer yeah, is really, yes. Yeah, that, yes, absolutely. And, and we sometimes like to see our entrepreneurs and founders put their own skin in the game. And so, that can be good to see. It doesn't happen all that often, though. Right. Let me add, so, add one actually, caveat to it. Honor, can I just can I just clarify? Yeah. I feel like some of this is that um, I, I'm guessing that some people have not watched our valuations webinar, and they're not understanding what pre-money valuation and post-money valuation mean exactly. Um, so could we uh, talk about what pre-money valuation is and what goes into a pre-money valuation and what post-money valuation is? Okay, I will answer it the opposite because it'll break down the problem easily. Okay. Post money valuation is pre money valuation plus total raise. So in here, the post money is 50 and we are raising 25 million. So the pre money valuation then becomes is 50 million minus 25 million, which is 25 million. So basically, round size of 25 million plus the pre-money of 25 million gives you the post-money valuation of 50 million. Post-money valuation is defined as all the shares in the company after this round, all the shares, option pools, founders, investors, everything that we have, we have now added or was present multiplied by the share price. So if I look at 50 million, that means it is here. 3.636364 million shares 
when multiplied by the share price of $13.75, gives us 50 million post money. These are all the shares that exist in the company. Now, what is pre money? Pre money is similarly all the shares outside the shares that have been offered for the raise multiplied by the share price. So let's look at what is the shares that were given for the investors. This round investors only. So this is the Series A investors and OUP. They have been awarded combined these two shares, right? 181,000 plus 1.6 million shares. This is the total number of shares that was given for the race. So if you multiply these by $13.75, you will get the round size. 25 million. Now, all the other shares, 950,000 to the founders, 50,000 for universities, 545,000 for the option pool, and 272,000 to the previous investors. If you add all of these up, multiply them by $13.75, you'll get the free money of 25 million. And so when you add this up, you add up all the shares and you multiply them by $13.75, you get 50 million, which is the post money. That was a good explanation, Einrich. Thank you. <laughs> it, and it went through the, I think, the, all the, the numbers once again, just understanding that these are the outstanding shares that came from the previous rounds, what people are then uh, purchasing for this particular round, uh, and therefore the total number of shares um, for the um, now post money valuation of this particular company. We know that this is this is not something that is um, incredibly obvious to people the first time they go through this. So it will help them perhaps to watch this a couple of times to understand that. We're happy to keep answering um, questions uh, about this. And I think that we may follow up with some people afterwards, but we probably do need to move on to the subsequent slides unless there's something else in here that you see that we should be um, answering right now. The only thing that I would say, maybe one more map to connect everything. You know, if you look at how do we get to what investors own and what investors own is they invest 25 million at the post of 50 million. If you divide 25 million divided by 50 million, that is 50%, right? So that means they should own 50% of the company. And this is how you check your math. If you look at all the shares that have been awarded to the Series A investors, which is OUP and other, you add them up and they account for 50% of the total shares. This is the other way when you awarded all the shares to confirm that the math is accurate is by doing raise divided by the post money is the ownership of the new investors. And that should match up. And sorry, I said that I, I was talking about the uh, the conversion amount, but I meant the total of um, uh, amount of shares uh, when we were talking about earlier. So there's 3.6 million at this point uh, between the rounds. So yes. I that I was not looking at the right number there. But so anyways, is there anything else on this particular slide? And I think there are some other questions. I'm going to keep going through them, but um, I think there are more questions. Yeah, and then again, as you go through them, they may become relevant later on and we can cover them because right. this is going to be difficult. Right. And what I would recommend everybody is to start building this in Excel by themselves and change the numbers here. Let's raise 20 million on 20 million and see how the numbers shape up and does your math hold up? Because once, till you make it yourself, it will be hard to understand. And, and to be honest, all of us have to build multiple of them and multiple scenarios to finally be able to now do it in a much easier manner. <laughs> so this is something that you have to do it yourself to be able to understand how the math goes. But it is it is all there. All the pieces are there in this. Um, so as people look at this, and we know this is something that's hard to like just look at this one slide and understand how the different parts are working together. We're going to work so through some more scenarios so you can start understanding, seeing how the flows actually um, work with this. So I'll let you guys um, start getting to that. I'm going to answer some of the other questions uh, that people are writing in um, and, while you guys are doing that. Anurag, I think there's okay, a, awesome. two, two yeah. recent questions that I think are worth you answering here, though. It's around the incentives of a seed investor. 
uh, okay. an angel investor in this case. And so just talk a little bit about the motivations for an angel investor to put an investment in through a convertible note at a 20% discount. Like what, what is really driving them to do that? Is it the returns? Is it the access? Yeah. I, so some, I think that is, that is both. Uh, you know, angel investors are look. their whole premise is to invest in very early stage technologies. And they are this kind of the financing that exists between a company being formed to being able to raise venture financing. This is the vehicle that has come emerged to fill that gap. So they are, it is an access to that stage of companies. Now, angels can come in all different flavors, but that's the primary flavor it comes in. The 20% discount is a returns driven because they are taking risk. As much as, let's say in this scenario, every scientist believes that their research is pristine, it is perfect. We all know that replicating data or showing the effect of the science being equally robust does not always pan out. And even at OUP, we have seen one of our investments, we tried to replicate the data externally and couldn't. So there is an inherent risk involved in it. And therefore, to account for that risk, they ask for a discount. And that's the 20% discount that you usually see in a convertible note. Now, one, one can always ask, why are venture investors valuing the company? Why is not everybody just taking a 20% discount and converting till the end? And that is because, you know, then it becomes a different return because that is a very longer term vision. When angel investors invest, that is only applicable to a small round. It's not taking them three years to deploy that or use that because there's a lot of value created. This is more of a small financing flavor that you do it for the near term, but it is too early to give the value to a company. And therefore this is used in earlier stages primarily or in some stages to bridge the company from very short term milestones where, and you get a discount to account for the risk you are taking that that milestone may not be met. But it is a much smaller risk compared to, let's say, what a Series A investor is taking on getting a development candidate nomination, which is a very large inflection and a much later down the line inflection. Right. But the the twenty percent that discount they get is um, is not what they're thinking about. They're not trying to make a twenty percent return because these companies are going to be private for a long time. And so someone's question was, is this the type of return you'd want as an angel investor in today's high interest rate environment? What most angel investors are doing is trying to invest in a company that's going to be worth billions of dollars, but they can never invest with the institutional investors. And so they're trying to access this. And just for that risk, they want the discount. It's not about a 20% return. It's about a, a thousand X return or a hundred X return. That's how they think about these things. Um, let's keep going. Yeah. Okay. So again, now we'll go through the next round of financing and which will add very similar math on top of the previous math. So hopefully doing it repetitively will help make things a little bit more clearer. So now let's say the Biostar Therapeutics has nominated a development candidate and is now looking to raise money to get it into the clinic and show that it works in the patient. So that's what the Series B round is for. And to do that, the Series B investors have given them a term sheet that tells them that they will invest $50 million round at $150 million post money valuation. As we had talked previously, what is the other way investors are thinking about? If you divide 50 by 150, it is 33%. So what investors are thinking is, I will invest 50 million to own 33% of the company. Everything else, that's the anchor point for them. And we will talk about this math again. It's playing out is these are the two fixed points. The share price needs to be adjusted to match these two variables. So what are some of the similar other terms that we saw in the series A term sheet was? Again, including the 15% option pool in the pre. 
Now you will see that we already had 15%, then why is this investor also asking for 15%? And we'll talk about this. But this is, again, standard uh, term that you will see. They are saying that if you need to add more option pool shares, add them, but they go in the free money. I still need to own 33% of the company and I will put a restriction that you need to have 15%. That's the investor's term. So when you account for those, now your share price goes to $25.07. Remember, it was $13.75, three cents, I remember. And so now it has increased from $13 something, almost $14 to $25. And this is an interesting thing, and we'll talk about more is, while your, your valuation has increased by 2x, your share price has not increased by 2x. And we'll talk about what does that mean. Um, and again, as previous investors, they had 1x liquidation preference, which is Series B investors have the right to take their money out first. And they Series B investors are senior to Series A investors. That means when the payout happens, Series B gets faced first, then the Series A. And remember, Series A is senior to common because preferred is senior to common. So Series a then gets the money before the money goes to common shareholders. The Series A did not have to say that because there was no other preferred investors before them. Now the Series B is looking, I have Series A preferred shares before. So how do I sit with them? Sometimes you'll see Series B will say, I am at the same level as Series A. So when the payout happens, both of us get paid at the same time. Sometimes here, what they're saying is, no, 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 we are investing later. We are senior. We will get the money first. And if there is money left, then the other shareholders get it. And this scenario will be walked through how it impacts people when money goes to different exit scenarios. And so again, 10% participation right kicks in. But OUP already had invested in the Series A round and owned 5% of the company. So the... The decision now has been is like, can we exercise the 10% right or use our investor right of an existing investor and invest by, you know, pro rata, which is investing as much as you own of the company. So if we own a certain amount, we invest that certain amount. So here, OUP maintains pro rata and invest 2.9 million. And we'll talk about this is basically doing of the, you know, pro rata of our uh, raise here which we'll again talk about in the next slide. And one, one comment before you go, or as you go to the next slide, Anurag, is uh, can you keep circling? As you're talking about certain numbers, would you mind using your cursor to um, just yes. follow it up? Thank you. Yes, sorry, I, I keep doing that sometimes and not at the other times. I will. And if, if I'm not doing it, please uh, let me know. Oh, oh we are have gone here. All right. So now again, uh-oh, go back. Yes, thank you. Uh, so now here again, we are building the Excel, right? We had the yellow before the pre-funding. The purple came for the angel funding. The blue came for the Series A. And now this round of funding, and this will be the Series B in the green. So again, let's on the top, you see the round size. It goes to 50 million. Remember, in the term sheet, what we, had, what we had said was 150 million of post money. So this was specified. So what does that mean? That the pre-money is 150 million minus the raise 50 million, which gives you 100 million pre-money. Now, based on these three, the share price now calculated is $25. Now, one thing that I'd mentioned, we will talk about is, if you look at the, what you, when you call, talk about a step up, there are two ways to think of it. Most people think is my last round post money was 50 million. It means after the investment, I was valued at 50 million. Now, when they invest, before the investors put the money in, now I'm valued at 100 million. That's my pre-money valuation before I took the investment. So that means I have increased the value by 2x, 100 million divided by 50 million. I was at 50 million. Now somebody's investing in me at 100 million. So I'm twice as valuable. However, when you look at the share price, it went from $14 to 
it did not go up by 2x, but it went by a slightly less than 2x. And there is a reason for that. And that reason is this option pool. And we'll talk about how it is impacted because you have to give some new option pool shares, which are included in the free money. Your share price does not go up by 2x, but goes slightly lesser. And we'll, we'll talk about this, what exactly that means. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that sometimes when we think about our value is increased by 2x, but the share price has not equally increased. And there is a, there is a reason why that is. And it's not an error in math. So let's walk through how the new shares are accounted for. As we talked about, OUP has invested 2.9 million. And the other investors, Series B investors, have invested 47 million. Note that OUP has invested this dollars on top of the two and a half million dollar shares that OUP invested in Series A. For the ease of calculation here, we have said that no other Series A investors are investing any more money. In reality, some of the Series A investors will also continue to invest in Series B. But we are just using OUP as an example of those investors as well, just to keep the math more simple. So this total becomes 50 million shares, $50 million that is erased. Now, given the $25 per share, the new share count that has been offered to OUP as an, as an investor in both series A and B, as a new investor in the series B, and this is for all the other investors that have come in. Now, what you see is in the new shares column, there is no other shares except this one, 351,000 option pool shares. Why is that? Now, along with investors, we have to give new option pool shares because of one of the terms in the term sheet. We said, you have to keep the option pool at 15%. So when you actually raised $50 million, you, that means you have to issue more shares. When you issue more shares, that means you have to issue more option pool shares to keep them at 15%. This is, this is called dilution, right? Uh, which is when you offer new shares, the existing shareholders' equities go down. So uh, let, let's see how that math plays out. If you look at the founders, they had 950,000 shares that they had got. And if I can go back, Manny, can you go back to the series A? Sure. Uh, Anurag, just remember, don't forget to use your cursor. Yes. So if you look at the founders, 950,000 shares gave them 26% of the company. Now, if you go to the series B again, Now the 950,000 shares is accounting to only 16% of the company. And that is because some of the new shares have been added. So their equity is diluted by percent. Their total number of shares has not changed. It's still 950,000 shares, but it represents a lesser fraction of the company because the total share has increased from 2.6 million shares to 5.9 million shares. So as the total number of shares increase, sorry, can you go back? Your percent equity will decrease. So if you see the 545,000 shares that we had given for option pool A, now they, it has diluted to become only 9%. But our term sheet said it has to be 15%. So that means we need to add 6% more shares to make it 15% which accounts to 351,906 shares that needs to be added in the option pool to bring it back to 15%. Now, this share, because it's included in the free money calculation, that is the reason why your share price does not go up by 2x, but your valuation seems to be going by 2x from 50 million to 100 million because these shares were have to be included in the 100 million. So again, let's go through the math of what is included in the pre-money valuation. So after the Series A, you had 2.6 million shares. That was all the shares that were there in the company. 
if you add 351,000 option pool shares, that is 2.6 million plus 0.35 million shares. That is around, it becomes 3 million shares. And when you multiply that, you know, when you multiply that by $25.07, then that becomes a hundred million. And I think there's a mistake. There should be 3.6 million. Uh, and the, <clears throat> maybe it should match from the last uh, one that we should have the 2.6 million plus 351,000 shares multiplied by $25 should become a hundred million dollars because it's all the shares that existed before the round, plus the new option pool shares multiplied by the share price will give you the free money. Let's do the math the other way, as we talked about. We are raising 50 million at a 150 million post money. That means investors should own 50 million divided by 150 million. That is 33%. And if you add these shares that have been awarded to the investors, 117,000 plus 1.8 million, that is two point, you know, that is around 2 million shares divided by almost 6 million total shares, that is around 33% of the company. So this is how to make sure that the math is. Now, we can't do this math here as we did previously, because remember, OUP has shares both from the series A and series B, and those shares are at different prices. To calculate the series B, you have to look at only the investors that invested in series B. So that's why when you add this 31 plus five for OUP, it becomes 36%. And that is primarily because there is some shares for OUP from the series A. Hey, Anurag, there's a good question here. Um... Do existing investors always get to participate in follow-on rounds? Do they get a discount? Yep. And what if there's a disagreement on the valuation between the different investors on the inside? I mean, I, that is a very good and a very loaded question. <laughs> yes, as your investors' rights agreement states, you have every investor likely has a right to invest their pro rata. And what that pro rata means is the fully diluted ownership in the company. So if we go back, uh, Manny, to the series A cap table. Sorry, I don't know how to go back. Like, let's say OUP uh, investors, series A investors own 45% of the company. Out of the 50 million that they're raising now, they have the right to invest 45% of that. And there's a reason for it. And that is because if they invested exactly their pro rata, like OUP did, they can maintain the ownership. And if you go to the series B now, Manny, you will see that because OUP invested its pro rata, its equity has not changed. It is still 5%. But the series A investors, like the founders, their equity percent has declined, which this was 45% to 27% now. And in order, if they had invested 45% of the round, their equity would have stayed at 45%. And this is a vehicle for all the investors to invest their pro rata to be able to main their equity percent in the company. So they do. So now the next question becomes is, what is if there's a disagreement? And how do the term sheet get decided? So there are two parts of that. One is, as a new investor, I give you a term sheet that defines certain valuation. Now the onus gets shifted to the company to either accept it or not. How does that process go? That is brought to the board of the company. Now, the board is made out of, generally composed of some common holders, some investors and independent, which are not associated with those two groups. This board's duty is fiduciary. That means it's financial. They don't take a look whether I am an investor, I'm a founder, I'm a common stock. They don't look at that. They say, is it right for the company? And is this the right thing to accept? 
as experienced people in the industry, let's say all of them say, you know what, this seems right. And one of the biggest questions in their mind is, if, do I have any other options? And when you have another option, then you can compare. If you don't have any other option, then that's all you have. And then the company is faced with two options. I don't raise money or I raise the money at this, at this valuation. And then most likely the answer becomes clear. When you can't raise money, you can move forward. So that now, but there's a next level question in it. The board in the end, that's the first level of board decision. The next level of board decision is the company says, my board approves that this deal is the right deal to do. Then the voting goes to the shareholders. That means founders can vote to say, I agree or disagree with the deals because they have common stock. The executives in the companies can vote whether they want the deal or not, or, and the investors who have invested, who have preferred shares will vote and each vote is equal to one share. Then they look at it and in the corporate documents, there is a decision saying, if 30% of the company votes or if the preferred investors vote, you have to take that decision. And these are financial, you know, these are corporate documents that are inside it. In most cases, there has been like, oh, if 50% of the company votes, you have to take it. And preferred shareholders have 50%. They have put the threshold there. So that means that the preferred shareholders say yes, then you can go and accept that deal without, even if other shareholders may say no. So it just, it, so you have to, it's like, it's like how we work in our election. You have to collect enough votes in your favor. And if they're above a threshold that is set in the corporate document, then it goes through, even though some voters may say this is not a good deal to accept. I hope that answers the question in a little bit more detailed manner. Is that so? Uh, and Kirsten, I don't know if you're going through the questions and any there other are questions. There are a lot of questions here. still. I'm trying to answer some of them yeah. um, just by typing in because I do want us to get to the exit examples in the yeah. remaining 27 Perfect. minutes that we have left. So. so, someone asked Does the board change every round and who gets to elect the board? We're going to talk about, I actually would rather we talk about this in the next webinar because okay. the next webinar is sure. on boards and board seats. So yeah. I think we need to use our time but, for the subject of this webinar. Yeah. But but let's answer it quickly. Yes, it does yeah. change. And with every new round, most likely new board members come on board and the board changes. Right. Great. Well, um, All right, Manny, I think now you're going to take them. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll take it from here. So, you know, next we're going to move into what we hope um, is a series of scenarios that elucidate just how ownership turns into uh, returns. And um, in this scenario, this is scenario one, we had a, uh, we had a good series A, a good series B, uh, round valuations went up and to the right, and then we had an exit. So Biostar announced some phase two data, which is a significant, 2A data, just a significant milestone in the biotech world. And the results were positive, which is more important. Um, and uh, a large company called Big Biopharma Inc., you can see our creativity here, uh, reaches a deal uh, with Biostar um, that they want to buy the company for $300 million, uh, all cash, upfront, no bio bucks, no milestone payments. So this is a $300 million deal uh, for the startup. And so it's a significant amount of capital. And um, we're going to see how that money turns um, that purchase turns into dollars for the people involved. So in that last uh, cap table that Anurag showed you, um, the this is the exact ownership percentages from that. So I'm not going to review that uh, with you here. This is the fully diluted percentage parts. Um, and they all sum up to 100. And um, in any exit scenario, there's a number of terms that are provided to preferred investors, the, the venture investors that invest in the Series A and the Series B, that help them decide, that give them the privilege of deciding whether they want to convert their ownership to common, which would align them with all the founders and option holders uh, in the university, or if they want to um, use some of their preferred rights, which generally in, this, in most scenarios is um, that you can get your money out first. And I'm not going to get into the nuances of 
uh, participating preferred, non-participating preferred. But for this company, uh, it was a 1x non-participating preferred uh, share for the venture investors. And the Series B investors were senior to the Series A investors. And those really come into play when companies have um, acquisition values that are around the total dollar size that they raise. But in this case that we're showing you here, the $300 million is much larger than the $78 million that were invested into the company. And so in general, in these situations, investors are turning their ownership into common shares and their value, the, the amount that they receive in the purchase is pretty simply just the fully diluted percentage times the total acquisition value. And so in this case, OUP owned 5% of the company and uh, that returned $15 million to OUP, uh, which created a 2.8X return for OUP. Similarly for the series A investors, 3.6 and series B investors 2.0. And so there's just two things to point out here. Um, the series A investors who invested at a lower valuation than the series B investors, but the series A investors did not put any capital into the series B, had a better overall return than the series B investors because the series B investors invested at 150 post and the series A investors invested at a 50 post. OUP, saw a slightly worse return than the, the Series A investors because we participated in the Series B. So we participated in both rounds, which is fine. We were able to deploy more capital, create a larger overall return. This, these are the things that venture investors think about. Um, and this is just sort of a way for you to see the differences between the different rounds that you can invest in. Um, the Series, uh, the seed investors who invested in the convertible note had the best return. Of, of all the groups involved. And that's because they invested early with a 20% discount. And so their 4.6X is um, roughly 20% better than 3.6X. That's kind of how that math plays out. Um, I'd say overall, from the venture perspective, these returns you know, are not anything to write home about. They're good. It's not what venture's in the business of doing. You know, We're looking for five to 15X type returns, but it's fine, it's great. Um, and I think these are the things that we're used to seeing every so often. Uh, sometimes there's zeros as we'll go through. And in this situation, you know, the great story is the university made money, the founders made money, um, and the people that were employees of the company also um, made money. Um, the return multiple in these scenarios is infinite, except for if you consider the cost of sweat labor in a denominator. Um, but generally, you know, I think in this situation, the founders are happy and most of the investors are happy as well. All right, so um, I think that is a reasonable walkthrough of this success story. Um, let me know if there's any questions, just interrupt me, Anurag and Kirsten. No questions but, yet on that. Um, you know, now we have this situation uh, popping up, which is, you know, if you remember scenario two, which is what if the company has things that don't go well? What if their clinical trial fails and the company must wind down? And this is um, what we're calling Scenario two, which was a good series A, a good series B, but a weak exit or a, a bad exit. And in this situation, you know, what probably happened in, in our hypothetical Biostar situation, the company had um, phase 2A data, but instead of being good, it was negative. Uh, maybe they had some talks um, and or some uh, data that just wasn't as expected. And um, but they still have two new molecules against the same target that show some promise. However, it's really hard to get over the negative results. And so um, investors you know, are looking for any reason to say no. And instead of raising that series C round, they have no options. No venture investor wanted to invest and that occurs. And um, it's happening a lot more now and now nowadays in 2023. As some of you all may be aware, just the markets are tough. Uh, the thresholds are getting higher for investments to get done. Um, and so Biostar had to go out to see if they could be purchased uh, because they had no other way of going forward. And big biopharma company uh, decided to buy them for $60 million in cash for the remaining assets. So not a $300 million exit. I mean, they had negative data, uh, but still some meaningful dollars. $60 million is no um, small amount of capital. And um, in this situation, a lot of people that are viewing what happened from the outside say, oh, people must have made a lot of money here. And the reality is this is not a good outcome, right? Um, 
as I mentioned, sixty million dollars, um, roughly akin to or less than the the, the seventy eight million that the company has raised. And so, in these situations, the in the venture investors, the Series A investors, the Series B Series B investors, who have preferred shares, take advantage of the terms that are in almost all venture deals, which is their liquidation preference. And so what happens in this payout waterfall is the venture investors get their money first. And then whatever's left goes to the holders of common or options. And in this situation, um, if you remember the terms of the round, the series B investors were actually senior to the series A investors. So senior to the Series A investors means the Series B investors actually get their, not just their money before the, the founders and the university and the option holders, but they get it before the Series A investors. And so the Series B investors, which were primarily uh, this row here, the $47 million uh, from Series B and the $3 million that uh, OUP invested, get their money, their ante first. And then what's left of that roughly $50 million from the $60 million exit is $10 million. So after that's paid out to the Series B investors, then the Series A investors get their preferred rights and they receive $9 million plus $1 million, only $10 million, not 25. There's nothing, there's not 25 left. Um, but then what's left after the Series A investors receive their capital is $0. And so in this situation, there's no capital left for anyone else in the company to receive return, receive um, an exit. And so this is the reality of, of what happens when you raise capital and a lot of capital and you don't exceed that return. And you know, you many people would look at this and say the venture investors are are greedy and and this is you know one structure of, of how they protect their investments. But the reality is a venture investor who makes a 1x return on $47 million is not going to survive very long. And neither is a venture investor who made a 0.4x on a $9 million investment. And so in this situation, no one's really ecstatic about the situation. And, um, and there's lots of other terms that can be integrated into term sheets that I suggest everyone reads this really good book called Venture Deals by Brad Feld, which just creates a bunch of different permutations of how venture investors do structure uh, their investments. It's things like the zone of indifference, participating preferred with you know, 2x multiple, 3x multiple, things like that are other ways that venture investors can um, juice their returns. And uh, in certain situations like we're seeing today, these are the terms, the exact types of terms that investors are using to um, not do a down round on the company, which we'll go into next. So before I do that, are there any questions on um, that we should answer for this part? Nope, uh, Anurag's been answering uh, them as we've been going along, so thank you. And I, I do, I would also just put, put in, you know, that the book by um, Felda Mendelssohn is, is really, really helpful if you're trying to understand how these venture deals work, and especially if you're getting venture capital in um, uh, for your particular company, read that book. Yeah. So this is just another kind of like a graphic way of just describing what's happening in scenario one and scenario two. Scenario one was the good $300 million exit. Scenario two was the weak $60 million exit. You know, in scenario one on the left is the ownership percentage blocks and how that maps to the payout is exactly by percentage. But in scenario two, because of the preferred structure and the blue box here was preferred to or senior to everybody, once again, even though they own 31% of the company, because they have preferred, they're receiving 78% of the, of the exit value. And so that's something that everyone should pay attention to when they see, you know, sometimes sizable 100 to $200 million exits. That's only a large number if the company hasn't raised a significant amount of capital. So um, now we're moving to scenario three, which is if the series B wasn't this up into the right round, but it was a down round. So that's this kind of current world we're in. Um, and in this situation, Biostar raised a $50 million series B, uh, which was, you know, it's a significant amount of capital. 
but they had some um, hiccups along the way. They didn't nominate a, a DC and they had some competitors pop up going after the same thing. And so uh, the Series B investors are um, still excited about the company, but they see there uh, being a higher risk for success um, given what's happening. And so they price it at, at a down round. This is a 4.45 share price, which equates to a $25 million option or $25 million pre-money valuation, which is significantly lower than the $50 million pre-money value or post-money valuation of um, scenario one and two's series A. So this is a classic down round. And in this situation, OUP is still investing their pro rata. We're still excited about the company. We want to keep our 5% ownership. Um, and the Series B investors are taking the rest of the round. And so I'm not going to go through this math again, given the time we have left. I'll just point out a couple things. What you'll notice is, as before, um, OUP, given that they're investing their pro rata, still has a 5% ownership, even though the, value, the valuation of the round is a down round. If you invest your pro rata in a company, your ownership percentage never changes. The Series B investors, however, for the same amount of investment, the same $50 million, they bought a lot more of the company because the post money valuation is $75 million, not 150. So generally speaking, um, as Anurag described before, the, the Series B investors were buying 33% of the company in scenario one and two. Now they're buying 63% of the company. The last nuance, which is, is what this what happens with the Series A investors here. Um, the Series A investors um, are seeing massive dilution. So they're going from what used to be a 27% um, ownership down to 10%. Similarly, the founders and the university are receiving a significant dilution too. But in the way we've depicted it here, it's akin to what the Series A investors are receiving as well. In reality, in down rounds, you actually have anti-dilution shares, which the preferred investors in the Series A would receive, but it's really in the weeds. It's nuanced, but it is significant because it, it, it um, provides kind of shares back to the Series A investors such that they're compensated for investing at, um, in the previous round at a price that was ended up being higher than what the next round was at. Um, and so, you know, when you look at how this math plays out, it's um, painful. Um, but the reality is the company's um, still on a trajectory for uh, possible success. They raised $50 million. And um, the next round uh, that we'll look at is what happens when they're acquired for $300 million. So it's still the same company it always was. Um, it's just they had to deal with a tough venture market and they had to sell more of their company in the Series B than they did in Scenario 1. And in this case, the company was acquired for $300 million. The reward for the founders was still significant, but it was uh, a lot of dilution that they had to, to suffer. And the um, overall return for all of the common and option holders was less than it, it was um, from Scenario 1, the other upside case. However, like a few things are happening here. So um, unlike in scenario one, which was always up and to the right, in this scenario three, the series B investors make the best return. They invested um, at a lower price than the series A, and so their returns are better. They received a 4X. And, um, and the series A investors have the worst return at 1.3X. And that's um, because they did not participate in the series B like OUP did. OUP invested in the Series A. They got hurt by the down round of the Series B, but they still invested, so they maintained their ownership. And so all of these numbers um, have been tweaked a little bit because of the down round. And similarly, like we wanted to show you how this looks pictorially. Um, in both situations for Scenario 1 and Scenario 3, there um, was a large enough exit that everyone converted uh, to common and and basically your exit value, your returns were comparable, were, were directly in line with the percentage of the company that you own. But because the Series B investors had been able to invest at such a low price, 
they did receive a much higher percentage or much higher return than the Series uh, B investors of Scenario 1. And so these are um, some key things to, to think about when you're taking um, investment at high prices. So in the markets of 2017 to 2021, startups were able to raise at really high prices. And that next round that they raised, if it's a down round, it does hurt that hurt their ownership, especially when you take into account some of the anti-dilution clauses uh, that are exist for preferred investors. Um, one of the questions just popped up, have you seen a trend given the economic environment that we're in um, for investors in, in B rounds? In general, um, we're seeing down rounds happen very often, if not flat rounds. And the other thing that's happening that we're always hesitant to do is uh, invest in rounds where some of these participation or participating preferred rights are high. So sometimes they'll have participating preferred rights with two or three X liquidation preferences. And the challenge with those terms um, is that they create a precedent for future rounds, which can, which can stack on top of each other. So those are the three scenarios that we wanted to run through. Um, we have um, any questions, are there any questions we should answer? Kirsten? Well, so I, I do before you do the final takeaways. So um, Manny, I know we get questions all the time because you know the, both this and, and the previous one we had done on cap tables and exits was a, you know, a therapeutics example. Could you just talk briefly about you know, anything, any differences you possibly see on the tech physical sciences side? Yeah, um, you know, on the tech side of the house, we oftentimes are seeing companies um, first off, that are able to raise, generally speaking, smaller nuggets of capital, but still get to value and get to various value inflection points, All, whether it's uh, prototypes or revenue. Uh, there's, generally speaking, um, smaller quantas of capital that they can raise over time so that the dilution is less painful. Um, there's also, I'd say, an aspect of uh, tech financings, which the valuations are just generally have been higher. Like there's just investors are buying less of these companies. And um, that's just a trend that's always existed. Uh, those are some of the, the key things I think about um, in these companies. The other thing I'd say is oftentimes in the tech world, when you do have down rounds, because you can sometimes, you know, make your capital stretch longer um, because you're not you know, working with CROs and building clinical trials, uh, down rounds are a little less painful because your quanta of capital can be sliced up a little bit. You can say, okay, let me take, instead of taking 30 at a $10 million valuation, let me take 10 on 10 so that I can just get through this financing storm or, or maybe just get another, you know, 2 million in ARR and then go out and raise again. So those are just some of the, the, the differences we see. And then another question. In the end, what I maybe it's like in the end we can see a differences in the amount of capital raised but the inherent math dynamics of this cap table does not change it's just the numbers of pre-money and the raises are, are disproportional right um what best practices do you advise to an early stage uh, or pre pre Preformation company um, uh, about having a clean cap table. As as an venture investor, <laughs> what are the advantages of having that that clean cap table? Manny, do you want to start? Want to start? Yeah, um, it's I, it's the hard part is it's first of all it's very advantageous. So have a clean cap table. The hard part is defining what's what's not a clean cap table, and certain things I think about that are challenging are when you have um, owners ledger line item hold equity holders who are not adding value to the company at all. And this goes both for venture investors and founders and um, you know hires that ended up not being valuable. And so on the founder side, always think about vesting so that if someone's not performing, you can um, you know they don't they're not necessarily going to be receiving those shares. And the other is um, with venture investors, just be really careful about who you bring on to the cap table. Not everyone is uh, as a venture investor is going to be able to deliver as much value as a key employee, but they're, but it's worth finding out what you're getting. And so I always encourage startups to talk to the portfolio companies of the venture investors they're bringing on their cap table. 
The last thing I'll say is be careful of taking too many convertible notes. We've seen companies raise a $3 million convertible note, then a $6 million convertible note, then a $7 million convertible note on top of that. And all of a sudden you're at what feels like a series A round, but your company is not worth $50 million. And so you've got to figure out a way to bring that entire $16 million convertible note stack into a round and it gets to be very challenging. So I'm not going to go to the details here, but it's really painful to, to deal with as a new investor coming into a company or thinking about investing in a round where there's a large convertible note stack. The other thing, like legally, you know, remember that each share, even convertible note or option pool, these are converted to common and these are one vote to a decision making. When you have a very spread out decision making to get to enough votes, and I've seen this sometimes, is you have a thousand investors, and to get to a threshold of approval on any decision, you have to track all of them down, get their approvals, and that can create a big burden in getting any decision made. Some of time on these financing. Let's see another piece just to keep in mind on the corporate operations perspective that may be important as well. I'm going to have you, Manny, move to the final takeaways and then go to our, um, we have, uh, you know, our, our um, contact information after this slide. It is really, in, we understand this is an incredibly complex topic um, and we're happy to talk with people more about this. So please, um, please feel free to write to us afterwards if you continue to have questions on this. Um, we do have this other video that you can watch on it. We actually have a couple of other ones that you can to help you understand how cap tables work and what that means for the waterfall at the end. So Manny, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, I think the main thing for any investor, any founder, any university that's on a cap table is that you will get diluted over time. And that's just the nature of taking venture dollars you can't go to a bank and get a $10 million loan when it's just two founders. And that's the purpose of venture. They, they, you know, that's why we exist. And so the reality is you're going to have to take on dilution and the way you can limit that dilution, how impactful it is on your ownership is to build as much value as you can with the X dollars you raise. So if you raise $5 million and you only turn that into $5 million of incremental value on top of your last post money, that is not that, that's not very significant. Or so I'd say, it's just not, you haven't added value. What you really wanna do is take a $5 million raise and turn it into $20 million of new value that's represented by what your next round of investors um, set your valuation at. And so um, that's really the key to controlling dilution. Um, you know, in, in this case for Biostar Therapeutics, Data readouts are the key um, measures of inflection. How strong those readouts are is probably the most significant parameter. In the tech world, um, it's oftentimes revenue or um, hitting actual commercial product stage. Things like that are what investors judge alongside the team and the markets you're in to help increase valuation. And um, you know, I think that valuation that you receive over time, as I mentioned, is what impacts the dilution and the long-term payout of the company. Taking a down round can be painful, but it doesn't necessarily mean you won't make any money. Um, really what you need to do is take the round. It, oftentimes in startups say like, the market will decide the valuation. And that's often where, um, how we set valuations and for our startups that we invest in and others. Um, that's kind of all I had for this. Anurag, any key thoughts you have before we wrap up? No, I, I think this, you know, this is one format. You will see every flavor. And to be honest, if you're unsure, run the math with some of the lawyers. They do this for day in, day out. The corporate lawyers build this, ask questions. Um, as a founder, this is not something that investors expect you to know and be very familiar with. So as, you know, when we form companies, we are always happy to walk through a map to the founders to show them how things change in good scenarios and bad. And so please feel free to ask questions. This is something that we live and breathe, but we understand that this is new for the founders and universities. Uh, and so nothing is, you know, out of the scope of asking. 
Great, thank you both. We can move to the last slide just so that people can see our contact information. We do have um, a, a couple of uh, outstanding questions. We suggest you follow up with us directly to ask those, um, or you can send it uh, as we send out the copies of the slides and the um, recording of this webinar. Uh, you can ask the questions at that point and we will uh, follow up with you then. We wanna thank you so much for um, being with us for so long today uh, and listening to us uh, go through these different scenarios. We know that the um, um, the terms are interesting and uh, uh, some of those were defined in previous webinars, so you may want to go back and watch some of those. I want to thank our audience for being here. Please do fill out that survey for us to help us um, explore future topics that we would uh, potentially look at. Let us know how this went today and what else would be useful onto this. I want to thank Manny and Honorog for doing such an excellent job of walking through with us with us today. I'd also like to hit, thank Harry Wan and Nabil Ulla um, on our team who did most of the uh, work behind actually these slides. So thank you both um, so much for putting this all together. And again, we really appreciated all of you being here today. Please feel free to follow up with us. We said it, this is not the easiest uh, topic and some of it um, just takes a few times understanding how the math works to, uh, to get through. So thank you very much.